there are many ways to be successful funding scientific research. The government's process generally is a call for proposals, a call for ideas. Then the ideas are judged by a panel of peers and that's how things get funded. This is Joseph Ring. I'm a cattle feedlot operator in Northern Illinois, and you're listening to the Vance Crow Podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad you're here. Today's guest is Paula Olszewski, who is a highly accomplished um, scientist and actually funder of research. She lives in New York City and has been overseeing large projects around air quality, and she has a very unique perspective on ways to uh, mitigate the the dangers of coronavirus. So we have this fascinating, wide-ranging conversation. We even talk about what it is to raise daughters in this modern world. We're going to get to that, but before we do, I want to talk a little bit about the Articulate Ventures Network. You know, when I think about why it is that I'm able to interview somebody as accomplished as Paula, it's because of my network, people that have introduced me to other people, that have introduced me to other people. And you never really know what the value of these relationships will be when you first have them. But that's the value of being a part of a network. So if you're looking around your world and you're saying, I would like to come into collisions with other people, people that I would not have met otherwise, you might want to consider the Articulate Ventures Network. These are people that found the network through the podcast, oftentimes participate in our monthly book club. This month we're reading The Hobbit just to be able to think about dragons and things that we need to face. And they're having constant conversations about things that are directed by the members themselves, people coming in and asking questions that are important to them and having other people in the network be able to talk about them in a long form. And they're sheltered from the prying eyes of the free networks that happen on things like Facebook and Twitter. So if you're interested, I highly recommend you check it out. It is a very interesting group of people. You can go to network.articulate.ventures to learn more. All right, without further ado, let's head to our interview with Dr. Paula Olswalski. Paula Olswalski, welcome to the podcast. Vance, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm really excited about the opportunity to talk with you and your listeners. It's funny because I was uh, I was trying to pronounce your last name and I stumble over it because I only know you as Paula, the woman that we see when we go up to Notre Dame games that makes fantastic dinners and feeds me too much wine. And so it's it's interesting to meet you in this professional context because I just know you as Paula. Exactly. You know, the matriarch of the what you know as the Healy family, but Actually, professionally and legally, I've always been Paula Olszewski. So anyway, <laughs> something important to me, been married a long time, just I needed to keep my name and I'm enjoying it. And so what's good the- about it, an unusual name, is that you, you want an email, email address on any sort of platform, usually you can use your last name at whatever that is. So anyway. So Actually, you, before we get to start, Vance, I do, um, you know, I, I, my day job is I, I'm a program director at the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation in New York City. And so I do have to sort of ha- put the disclaimer that these remarks are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Sloan Foundation. So thank well, you. I'm so glad you did that because that means that we can just really put the hammer down here and everybody knows these are Paula's thoughts. These are my, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Well, so you may be like that Dos Equis, uh commercial. You may be one of the most interesting women in the whole world. You have this background in chemistry from Yale and MIT. You work at the Sloan Foundation. You've done everything from biosecurity to synthetic biology. And uh, you, you have all this culture from living in New York. So I've been very interested to, to, uh, to have this conversation. And it's hard to even know where to begin. But you're in a very unique role for what's gone on with the pandemic because you have this background in biosecurity but also air quality so when you think about the pandemic and what people do and don't know about it what is something you think is being overlooked first of all the pandemic is top of mind for me every day most of the day you know we do not have a vaccine we do not have medicines And so our only defenses are basically old-fashioned and some new public health 
measures and environmental measures. And um, your kind introduction, my, when I was working in biosecurity, um, one of the issues we tackled was if there's a threat in the air, how do you make buildings how do you make buildings safer since people spend 90% of their time in the building? So back, you know, um, this is sort of after anthrax and so on, we worked with building engineers and building owners and academics and indoor air quality experts to come up with some guidance. And there's actually a, a publication that I'm an author of in 2006 that talks about you, using the HVAC systems in buildings to deal with an aerosolized threat. So, and there's also another paper that I wrote uh, with uh, two other colleagues uh, back, I think this is in 2006, called What to Do Before the Vaccine Arrives. And the, these different measures that I want to talk about the importance, like people have known about them for a long time, but it's hard to get people to change their behavior. If someone tells you, don't eat a cheeseburger, it has too much fat in it, like, I still want to eat the cheeseburger. <laughs> All right, so, you know, public health, they tell you not to smoke, they tell you don't eat the fat, they tell you to exercise. more. So, you know, they're always, whatever they're asking you to do, it, it's always just, it's not really what I want to do. On the other hand, they have good advice for us, as well as these people who work in industrial hygiene and um, in the indoor environment, because again, they've been working on it for 20 years. I mean, they were probably working on it somewhat before the anthrax attacks, but there are, un there are amazing scientists in academia and in government who have been working on this pro issue of what to do so that we can have healthy congregation indoors, because isn't that what we want? Don't we want to spend time with our family and friends indoors? I don't know about you, but like I've been lonely during the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, it's the very fabric of society is the ability to, to collide with other people. R refresh my memory because I remember anthrax being a big deal, but I couldn't tell you anything at all about what that situation was all about. All right. So this is a sort of very short snapshot. Someone with access to anthrax. I mean, anthrax can be like in a cow pasture, but this seems to be sort of lab grade, maybe weapons grade. Put anthrax in a series of envelopes and sent them to uh, a, at least a, one member of com, com, Congress, Senator Daschle, to um, NBC News. And I'm particularly sensitive to that because the Sloan Foundation offices in New York City are in Rockefeller Center, and that letter went to Rockefeller Center. All right, so people, so it, it was in the air. People were terrified of opening their mail. There was a lot of um, concern over how do you decontaminate the Senate office buildings? How do you decontaminate the postal uh, the devices, it turns out the, the mail, the, the big pieces of equipment used to sort of sort mail quickly, they would squish the envelope and it would just dis be a great dispersal mechanism. So the people working at the post office were very concerned. And then there were also some social concerns because if you're a very important senator in Washington, D.C., you might have access to better options than if you're you're a you know, post office worker um, working at a post office in New Jersey. And I'm sorry to say, I don't even remember what it is. And so, um, so the, this is when I and the Sloan Foundation president at the time, Ralph Gomery and others said, okay, we've got to figure out how to deal with this stuff in the air. We really have like, and also at that time, masks were not popular. <laughs> and it, it, Ralph, at one point said, well, if there's something in the air, what side of the mask do you want to be on? <laughs> okay. It's just so, it's, so, 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 so anyway, um, 
the other um, issue in sort of talking about like, you know, bioterrorism and what's in the air, you know, anthrax in the air and bring it back to the pandemic is that generally, I'm not saying this is true of all medical professionals, but generally they have been, you know, it's so rigorous to get, become an MD or a physician's assistant or a nurse. They really don't spend time on aerosol physics, environmental engineering, industrial hygiene. I mean, they just, you know, they, they, they wanted to go to medical school. They wanted to go to nursing school. They wanted, you know, they want, so they, they have taken the classes that they needed in college to do that. And then they're in a very rigorous college. So often they uh, did not appreciate the need to sort of look at buildings as a way of protecting ourselves from bio threats, whether they're naturally occurring or, um, you know, man-made and, they are all right. So one of the programs that came out of the Sloan's bioterrorism program was called the microbiology of the built environment program. And, and the reason we got into that is when we were looking at buildings and um, you know, what's in the air and so on, we realized that we didn't know what, what the natural, microbial profiles of just ordinary buildings look like. We, we didn't know. No one studied it. And so when after the anthrax attacks, we had all sorts of efforts to like develop sniffers for what's in the air. And they would, they would say, oh, it looks like we have something terrible there. And it's, oh, no, it's not. You don't have some terrible bioterrorism threat. That's, it turns out, you know, that sort of, a naturally occurring harmless microorganism in your in Texas or in Toronto or it, wherever you are in the world because there is there's a there's a some sort of geography associated with the with the microbial world just as you know a, a coral reef looks different from a a forest yeah, exactly. Um, Why sourdough tastes different in San Francisco as it does in New York. Just the, the, the oh, and the hands of the all right. So then there's the hands of the baker. All right. So, but I, my, I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry, I'm fidgeting a little bit, but I get all excited when I talk about this. So, so we said, okay, we want to study ordinary buildings where people live, work, and play. We want to take the tools that were developed to. Uh, uh, sequence the human genome. So we, that was a big, big project, a lot of tax dollars in the Department of Energy, a private effort led by Craig Venter, who was actually one of my grantees, an amazing scientist, to like really understand what's indoors, just basically first catalog what's indoors and how does it change? How does the building impact it? How do the people impact it? So very basic questions that scientists would ask of natural environments. It's sort of like, well, what's in those hot springs at Yellowstone? That's interesting. And actually what came out of some of that research is novel enzymes that work at really high temperatures that are part of our industrial processes now. So, so some of the medical doctors whose opinions I value, I use as consultants, said to me, Paula, you're just funding a fishing expedition. You know, we know how disease transmits. And I just said, I'm not so sure. Like, you know, I appreciate your opinion. Anyway, so we've, we've made a long progress since uh, I was, uh, you know, listening. And I, and I take, when people are critical of a program that I'm running, I, I always listen to them because I want to, I, I want to understand what's going on in the building. I want to understand, you know, how to protect myself and my family and my colleagues from the threats posed by the pandemic, how, like all of these things. But I want to understand how it works, why it works, and why we know it works. It's also good to understand our limits to knowledge that, well, we know this much, but we don't know more than that. But with future research, we'll learn a lot more. So Vance, I don't know where we went on this, but 
you know. So it sounds to me like you you were trying to develop systems to detect what was in the air, and what you discovered was like there were things in the air that we weren't expecting to be here, but in almost in a way that it's a false positive. It's it's we at first are alerted about it, and then it doesn't turn out to be a real thing. But did you discover things that were in the air that were not false positives, that were positives? Yeah, so and like, Oh, man, we got to get that cleaned right. up. So, Vance, you're sitting in a room. I'm sitting in a room. All right. Now, one of the things that uh, the government fund research was uh, and still funds is work on the human microbiome that we as people have are covered by microbes. They're in our digestive system. They're just about everywhere. And there's some, and what the microbes in the skin of my elbow are different than the skin, the microbes found in my armpit versus, you know, wherever you want to look. And that these microbes, the reason we didn't know a lot about them, well, sometimes you don't even look for them, but the, another reason is before we had these modern se- techniques for sequencing genetic material to then come up with sort of like the fingerprint or the blueprint for the uh, microbe or viruses, DNA or RNA, we did two things. We meaning the scientific community. We would attempt to grow the microbes. So we'd take a sample and then we'd try to grow them. Now, I know you've done a lot of work on farming, Vance, and if you don't have the right conditions, can you grow corn everywhere? No, uh uh-uh. uh. Yeah. All right. So, all. so in terms of here are these scientists that, you know, what, so it turned out the scientists who are using what we call culture dependent methods were, ba- were studying the, the microbes that grew the fastest under the conditions that were developed. And this was before we knew that microbes communicated with each other. And if you have one microbe there, it will influence how another microbe behaves. This is before we knew that microbes sent chemical, sent these chemical signals to each other. But again, so this is sort of like a whole, this is a wonderful science. All these things we didn't know 15 years ago are relevant. Okay, so you're in your room, I'm in my room. All right, so let's say we're gonna, we wanna do a quick experiment. You know, Paul, what's in your room? I'll say, you know what, Vince? Some grantees led by a scientist named Jack Gilbert determined that when people come into a room after, I I can't remember how many hours, but less than a day, the room, the microbial profile of the room looks like the people. So your, 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 your room, your office, the microbial profile will resemble you. Your home, it will resemble your family. If you have guests coming to stay with you for a while, the guest microbial imprint will, will join your family's imprint. So the so there's certain things about the microbial world that are that come from the humans. And right now I'm talking about generally bacteria. So these are unicellular organisms. Viruses are a little different. Because viruses need to live in a cell. They need to live in something. So like the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus right now is living in us if we're infected. So anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I, I get so excited talking about this. But the, so the point is we're embedded in a microbial world. We, our microbes are very important for how we digest food and our, our digestive tract. Uh, I, I don't know if our human number of human cells to microbial cells, the numbers keep changing, but it's at least one to one. But in terms of the genes, so the genes within in a an organism, so the you you know the genes on my chromosomes are responsible. They have some functions there. But the my the my microbes, I think, have a lot more function than my human genes. So we're we're in partnership with the microbes, and for good reasons. Well, it makes sense to me why somebody might have a criticism about it being fishing when you talk about the microbiome, because it's just so vast. I have a a friend right now that runs a company um, that is searching out for um, 
uh, microbes that are beneficial, that essentially can yes. be used oh, like no. chemistry. Yes. And so he's trying to isolate them because in order to get a chemical deregulated to be able to be used in agriculture, the bar is really high. But if you can get a microbe that's Probably. naturally occurring in the soil to produce that chemical or to produce that outcome, then the, the deregulation is di very different because it's naturally occurring. But what he always talks about is like, we are flailing around in the dark grabbing one and hoping that we can isolate it enough to make it do what we want, but we don't always even know why it's doing what it's doing. Right. And also there was some interesting work uh, published a few years ago by Kim Lewis, a researcher at um, Northeastern University, who showed that you needed to get certain microbes to grow, you needed other microbes to grow with them. And he came up with some novel way of getting microbes to grow. Because if you can get them to grow, then you can learn more about them. As you say, what chemical what, what functions are they, are they performing? And, um, and, and oh, and I met, I have the other tidbit I forgot to see. So you can see microbes under the microscope, okay? <laughs> okay, so you can see them. And so people knew that there were microbes there that, they, that were visible, but they couldn't culture. So anyway, that's, I don't know. We've talked a lot about microbes indoors. And it, it turns out um, the indoor microbes can be very important to your health. Again, going back to some work led by Jack Gilbert, then at the University of Chicago, now at University of California, San Diego. He studied the house dust of Ch Amish children and Hutterite children. I don't know if you're familiar with this work, but... No, this is super Because of your work in, in, with, on farms, uh, one group r uses traditional farm animals to do the titling and whatever. The other group uses modern farm machinery. And I don't know that much about farms. So Vance, you know more about that. But the point is, these Hutterite, the Hutterite and the Amish communities in, in the Midwest, I can't remember exactly where they were, but this paper was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. All right, so basically, the genetic backgrounds of the people is very similar. And it turned out that the house dust, it was different on the farms from the Amish, where I'm pretty sure they had the traditional big horses and the children could have a lot of access to the farm animals. Whereas in the Hutterites, um, were using the modern farm equipment. So the children weren't out there, you know, with the with horses, horses and, yeah, and okay. so on. And so it turned out the, the Amish children have a lot less asthma than the Hutterite children. And so scientists are saying, wow, who knew that the indoor microbes, and some of these experiments are done on mice. I don't know if they've been done yet on human, but just like had a real impact on whether you develop asthma. Nobody wants their kid to develop asthma, but we don't know why. So this is, this is an example of ongoing work that, you know, the Sloan Foundation has completed its funding in this area, but other of just this whole new field of trying to understand the role of the indoor environment, particularly on the microbiome and how it um, impacts, you know, the health of children and their futures. Well, one of the things that I have a friend that uh, started an air filtration company and he would go around and I want to meet all his, your friends. I well, feel like you are one of them. So <laughs> So it was he. It was interesting because um, you and I have talked a little bit about air filtration, and I'm a little bit nervous about putting an air filtration system in my house for the very reason of the uh, what's it called the hygienic uh, hygiene. like hypothesis hygiene hygiene hypothesis, which is basically saying if you if your children are in too clean of an environment, then they're going to develop allergies and asthma. The thing that you're talking about here. Right. Where do you fall on that? Like, is it better to clean the air and get rid of the, the bad things or so is it too big of a trade-off? All right. So I will disclose that I have a HEPA air cleaner in my bedroom, which I've had for several years. This, is, this was not purchased for the pandemic. So why do I have this? Well, modern society, okay, we have air pollution that various industries, you know, generate, cars generate, whoever generates it. We have different practices to cut that down. But the, there are particles in the air and they're described as PM 2.5 and PM 10. And that PM 10 
sort of is the big particles, the PM 2.5 or smaller, and you can really get into people like when you breathe them in. And so I was at a workshop on particles. So we're not talking about microbes. We're not talking about indoor chemicals or chemistry. We're just saying there are these particles in the air. And it turns out that high part, you know, polluted air with high particle counts has lots of bad effects when you do these giant studies of hundreds of thousands of people comparing their health outcomes to their air pollution according to their geographic region. So, so for people who are worried about heart health, you really don't want to be breathing in pollution, those particles. Reproductive health, it has impacts. And so it turns out air pollution has a lot of adverse health impacts. So when I do have my windows closed, I operate my air filter at five air changes per hour um, during the day to just kind of flush my bedroom. And then at night, I switch it to one air change per hour. If the windows are open, it's sort of pointless because I'm bringing in so much outdoor air. Why am I just putting it through my filter? You can also learn about your air, outdoor air quality. Very Most of the weather apps, if you really dig into it, you'll find for your location what the particle counts are in your region. So, and so this is, these are just simple things you can do to sort of help yourself. But, you, but again, when I say to people, oh, you know, you open up that weather app. Okay, go down here. No, keep going, keep going. Oh, I had no idea all the stuff on, on my local air pollution was here. So, so armed with that, information. I know that you're uh, speaking as yourself, just as yes. Paula, but um, you, you talked about your grantees and you talked about yes. uh, Craig Ventner who uh, went out in a kayak and started collecting ocean samples. And, and then this led to a whole bunch of discoveries about uh, microbiology that was going on in the ocean. You're talking about air pollution. So when you think about um, who you offer grants to or who you help guide through that process, how are you making sure that you don't create a selection pressure? I mean, to, to, to have funded Craig Ventner is an amazing thing, but that you're um, keeping a wide enough selection area open that novelty, things that people don't already know are true are going to be there. Uh, and, and yeah, how do, you, how do you navigate this, deciding how to, how to hand out this money? This is a very good question. And there are many ways to be successful funding scientific research. The government's process generally is a call for proposals, a call for ideas. Then the ideas are judged by a panel of peers and that's how things get funded. The, it turns out though, that particular system is fraught with all sorts of biases and so on. Um, underrepresented groups, including women, often don't fare well in that. Sometimes novel ideas are just, they're just too risky. They want to see some preliminary data and so on before you can get funded. So, but, but that is a valid approach. And I have used RFPs, requests for proposals, in some of the work that I've funded. But my approach, and again, every person who funds you know, works in a foundation, does things differently, is to study a problem, bring together experts from the different fields, talk to them, and try to figure out where is the novelty. And then identify and interest people who I think, people who are generally working on something else. So I'll give you an example for the indoor chemistry. I have a program to study indoor chemistry. The the way I started this program was similar to the way I started the microbiology of the built environment program. And that you take someone who's a world expert in studying, studying outdoor environments. So the example we've used is Craig Venter, who's an extraordinary scientist. He's, he's extraordinary. He, he gets his, his people stay with him. They do amazing work and he takes risks, but he supports his people. And it, it uh, again, it's my little, 
my personal um, opinion about Craig. All right, so in, so finding somebody who then is willing to switch, you know, go in these in both cases, just from studying outdoor environments to indoor environments. Okay, and I can give people money to do that, but what I can't do is I can't buy passion. I it, the the idea has to be compelling enough for the person, the scientist, so that at 11 o'clock at night, they're still thinking about, well, what, what, you know, these experiments I'm doing indoors, it's really different than what I did outdoors. Is this like a contamination? Is this coming from the people? Like, what is this? So, uh, so one example I'll give is a, a you know, a, a, one of the leading atmospheric chemists in the world, His name is John Abbott. He's at the University of Toronto. So I've been working with people and studying, and so I, I sent him an email saying, oh, you know, I'd like to talk to you about studying chemistry indoors. And, uh, you know, he talked to me, and, you know, I, I can't force him to study. I, I, you know, he's like, he doesn't need any money from the Sloan Foundation. He doesn't need me calling him up, all right? But if I'm, you know, I said, I think this could be interesting. You know, would you be interested in, you know, it, testing it out. Well, now he's one of the, he's, he along with many other Sloan Indoor Chemistry grantees are some of the world's experts on the chemistry that's taking place indoors. And again, it's an unexplored place. So he's shown that some of the physical properties of chemicals that occur outdoors, when they come indoors, they're a little bit different. They're stickier. Outdoors, they're more volatile. Indoors, they're stickier. Okay, so what does that mean in terms of your indoors outside of like, what's sticky? Are there sticky things indoors? Did you ever like clean someplace that hadn't been cleaned in six months? Yeah. It's got a sticky stuff on it. Is it hard to get off? Well, you know, it's indoor chemistry. And, you know, so, there, so there, anyway, so, I, so there's a lot happening indoors. People play a huge role in indoor chemistry just in terms of um, the personal well, you care were, products. You were talking about this, uh, this concept of passion, and that kind of might – I, I want to experiment okay. on an idea with you, yes. which is um, – I use this concept. We all have voices inside of our head. Yes. Some of them say, hey, you should get up and work out. And another one is like, you should go back to bed. You don't need right. to work out, right? And so you have these voices, but there's usually one that uh, rises to the surface and it really directs something deep in you about, I should go on this path, even if there is no clear path out there. And um, you could you could give it a bunch of different names, but I often use the the word daemon, right? Not demon, but daemon as this idea of this deep inner voice that directs you to be curious about something. And the curiosity is the thing that uh, is what makes you be able to be passionate, right? Without curiosity, yes. there is no passion. Exactly, I Would agree. You describe it. So you're you're essentially going and finding people that have a daemon that is directing them towards something or at least being like, Hey, does your daemon say you want to come over here? Exactly. And the, so that's, that's one thing that um, you can do when you sort of invite people. But the other thing you can do is observe both from afar. And if you do a lab visit, the, the climate and culture in their laboratory, I got my PhD in chemistry from MIT a long time ago. I was in a, a lab that was very supportive of women. Chris Walsh is my mentor. I mean, he's an extraordinary person. There were always women in the lab. And as he said, well, his wife became the president of Wellesley. So maybe if he married someone else, it would have been different. But anyway, the, um, and he's retired now at Stanford. But anyway, so I was in a supportive environment. But when I stepped out of that door, there were many people who were hostile to women. Before I got to MIT, I was told by some of my professors at Yale, like how wonderful it was I was going there. And just remember, this professor and that professor didn't take women in their lab. And I was, I was grateful to know that at least. Okay, that's fine. But then there's also sort of a climate of hostility. And the, um, 
it, I don't think they do this anymore, but at the time, every month the chemistry graduate students had to take tests you couldn't study for. They were called cumulative exams. And there were five different um, areas of chemistry that were given at the time. Biological chemistry, analytical chemistry, organic chemistry, physical chemistry, what am, I, what am I forget? Did I say inorganic, organic, physical, analytical, and bio? And so for for a graduate student who arrives at MIT, you're like, you know, people had different backgrounds, different, uh, you know, they were all good enough to get in, but it's very intimidating that you now ha are required six months in to start taking tests you can't study for because you're supposed to be learning chemistry 24-7. So, and then, this is something else that I don't do now, is you, so you would go to a room, you have like two hours, they would give you all, you would get a handout of all five tests. You could take as many as you wanted. All right, so you pass them in, and then a few days later, they posted everyone's grades. You would go outside, there was a secretary named Marion Curley at MIT, and, and, it was horrible because you could because early on you you know to you needed six of these six passing grades if you had an A and a C then that gave you a B one A and one C equal two Bs so that was two passing grades but it was very this was horrible all right and so I would go with a couple of the other women we would look to see how we did and then we would run to this. They also didn't have many ladies' rooms in the chemistry department, so we would have to run to the basement. We'd go by the candy machines and run to the basement and go into the ladies' room and cry. All right. And then, all right, so, but also people know when you start passing them. And so one of my fellow graduate students, so they can see I'm passing. Okay. So he says to me, well, you know, the only reason you're passing is biochemistry is easier than what I'm studying. So you know what I said to him? I said, well, that's so easy. Why didn't you take that test? But I'm just saying, okay, so this, this sort of hostile, this kind of just hostility around me. Okay, now who knew? Who knew I'd be funding chemistry? Still has, feel, still has some problems. But a lot of women like it. Underrepresented groups like it. I think more than half of the undergraduate chemistry majors in this country are women. So I would go visit labs. Uh, before I actually, actually before I even invited a proposal and talked to someone, I would look at the pictures on their websites. Yeah, you know, there's a picture, you know, you go look up professor so-and-so. The culture in chemistry, you always have a picture of people in the lab and what they're doing and whatever. So who was in their lab? Okay, was it all white males or was it a more diverse group? All right, so I just looked in terms of who came to their laboratory. Then when I visited, I'd say, okay. When I, I would, it's sort of what I call doing the eyeball test. How do the graduate students look? Are they terrified? Are they miserable? Because the graduate students and the postdocs, like you need the famous professor or the, the driven professor to get started. But the graduates and students and postdocs are literally working 24 seven in the lab to come up with their, the findings and do the experiments. And so the, so I would always look at the climate. Now, is this is some flexibility that I had at the, at the Sloan Foundation. The Sloan Foundation has, a, has always had a commitment to um, diversity in STEM in terms of underrepresented groups and women. But I was just living it. I mean, I, I lived it when I was a graduate student. I just like I didn't, I wanted to, it, for it to be better. And the, you know, if you look at the demographics of the interchemistry program, we have women. We don't have as many underrepresented groups. Um, but again, at the faculty level, we have, you know, in terms of at the graduate student and postdoc level, we have some diversity. But the other thing is we have an inclusive climate. And all fields can be really competitive. All right, if you want, what's that expression? If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go farther, go together. So my philosophy in the program was, this isn't competitive. This is, 
a collaborative program. So the senior faculty help the junior faculty. It just, and anyway, so I, I find that the, so this is how I've run one small program at a small foundation in New York City, but I think it's, it's going to have a great impact. So you would be a very good person to ask this question because it is a delicate question, but it's one that I think about a lot. You have raised uh, two hyper successful daughters, uh, one of which is a mathematician on the most elite level. And uh, I married a woman that's an aerospace engineer whose sister is a you know high level attorney. And we just had a daughter. And as I hear people talk about uh, separating out and making a distinction between boys and girls or men and women, and uh, where they ought to be or the things that face women. On the one hand, I wanna make sure that my child has the advantages and the space to be, to be able to, to work and, and pursue the thing, her daemon. That's what I really want right. for her. But on the other hand, the things that made me the strongest in the world are the thing, the, in, in my own world, are, is the adversity that I faced. And so sometimes I wonder when we think about trying to clear out barriers based on something like sex or race or anything like that, it's not that I think we should intentionally place them there, but I have to wonder if that we aren't um, going to suffer from the, the uh, and this is just off the top of my head, the hygienic um, hypothesis, right? Where you start cleaning things out so much um, or you start focusing on it so deeply that you have other consequences that come that you don't fully understand. So it's, it's one of the things that I'm very careful because I don't want my child being um, told that, that she is somehow lesser and therefore we need to create advantages because I want that child to suffer enough that they can build up the resilience to be the sort of person that can pursue their daemon. And I'm, I'm, so I don't really know what the question is other than so Vance, how do you I think, think about that? I think there's enough suffering in the world that if you alleviate some of it in people's educational processes or research processes, that they uh, will not be um, totally sheltered from suffering. But it's just sort of like if you're trying to, you know, let's go back. I love gardening. Too bad I don't have a garden here on the 14th floor in New York City. But the, the you know, if you, you plant some seeds, you don't want to trample them. <laughs> okay? You know, the seedlings come up. You don't want to trample them. Okay? Once it's a big plant, it's harder to trample. So I think that in terms of um, sort of mentoring, particularly in the STEM fields, particularly for groups who feel marginalized or have been marked, if you just sort of look at the data, um, the, you know, is it sort of like, oh, you're not tough enough to make it? Or is it just like not worth it if it's that hostile? So I think that, um, so getting back to raising daughters. Okay, I, I, I got two daughters. I was blessed with them. I never raised a son. So I can't, I have no insight there. I married a great husband. So my mother-in-law raised great sons. <laughs> All right. But the, um, I think what, one of the things that I that my husband and I passed on to our children was a work ethic. You ha it's to do your best. You don't start out at the top. Learning is a process, but you you to strive for that. And um, as you know, um, both of my daughters, as well as um, many other people, are competitive swimmers. Now that's they chose it. I didn't choose it. That's a sport where there's a lot of process, there's a lot of practices. You rarely win anything, but you can monitor your personal progress in that, did you, whatever you're swimming. Did you go a little bit faster? Did you just go, it's like, wow, you took two one hundredths off your time. So that's a work ethic uh, and so on. And so they could swim a personal best that, you know, Great. They were, I mean, it wasn't going to win them a trophy at the meet or at the school or whatever, but it was, it was sort of the work ethic and that they could find some joy and also just experience hard work. So I don't know. Did I answer the question? Well, I, so the, you oh, and we you have to get back to the pandemic at some point, but I am having a good time talking about all of these things. So when you brought up the gardening metaphor, I, I the thought that came to my mind is um, uh, jalapeno breeding. 
So uh, when oh, they started, I don't know to, anything about this. So when they started to uh, take jalapenos to the commercial grade, where you could produce enough jalapenos that you could have them in grocery stores all the time, they put them in these perfect environments, right? So they had all the water they needed, all the sunshine they needed, and they found out that every single year jalapenos became less and less hot. And so the very thing that they wanted was hot jalapenos. Right. But because they gave them everything that they needed, um, they weren't producing capsaicin, which is the oil that is what makes them spicy. So what they figured out was, actually what we need to do is put them in this great environment where they can grow, but then create stress, pull on the branches, shake them, make it so the plant itself has to produce this thing because it believes it's in that stressed environment. Right. And, uh, that's something that I want to know, like, how do you create that stressed environment while still having a good, beautiful garden with lots of fruit? Well, but again, I go back to, you know, young children, you know, you don't want to trample them. You want to teach them to work hard. You want, you know, teach them to be kind and care about other people and be the best, they're be you know, find their role to make the world a better place, all of these things. But the, when you, when you get to, um, you know, into a classroom. All right, let's, all right, you've already disclosed uh, one of my daughters is a mathematician. All right, so I, she grew up in a family with lots of resources, highly educated parents, and so on. Yet she had, and she went to a wonderful private school for grades K through eight. But for high school, she had to go to a public school in New York City, called, she, she, it's, a, it's a competitive test to get in, but the, it, um, it, the school focused on math and science and could provide for her, even though it's competitive to get in and there are lots of competitive students there, it was really a nurturing environment. It nurtured her interest in math, even though there were I don't know, 35 kids in a classroom rather than 18, uh, all, all sorts of things. But so she had stress there, but she also, people valued sort of the process. Now that school isn't good for, isn't good for everyone, but it's been great. It was great for her. And it, I, I think it's an asset to the country. All right. So, but we learned really on that about her interest in, proclivity in math that we nurtured because if she's interested in it, okay, we, we both took a lot of math. So let's now go to, you know, a gazillion years later, I'm at the Sloan Foundation and I um, also direct some of the work that we do in New York City, we call our civic program, New York City Initiatives. We don't, as a philanthropic foundation, we don't pay taxes. So we try to do things to help New York City. So we, we fund a, a program called BEAM, Bridges for Advent Entering Advanced Mathematics. And this program starts in sixth grade. You're like, you can say, oh, the Soul Foundation doesn't do K through 12. All right, so I said earlier, we want, the, we want to encourage women and underrepresented groups to get PhDs in STEM fields. All right, so that means they have graduated from college, with a strong enough record to get into a graduate school. That means they graduated from high school to, with enough math or math skills so that when they went to college, they could major in STEM and whatever. So this particular group focuses on, on poor kids and works with poor schools and identifies kids who like math. And it's not like an achievement test because these, these are not... A, these kids are at very poor schools, but like, they like to do math problems. And some of the work we funded was it brought them in for a summer math a day camp. And you know, they had sports, they had fun things, but you know, most every, they're different, you know, you do math problems in this, do math games in that, and so on. And it was, I went and visited it before we funded it. And it was just like, it was so exciting. And like to be there with all these like kids, like sixth graders, like all excited about the numbers and the math and the patterns and what they could see and so on. All right. So I was like, oh, yeah. So, but then it turns out in New York city, and this may be true in other communities that um, when you're, sometimes you don't have a choice where you go to high school and sometimes you do. 
and we already had the example of Vivian got in, you know, went to this famous high school called Stuyvesant High School that produces mathematicians, physicists, Nobel Prize winners, and so on. But, you know, I don't know, seven, only seven or 800 kids a year go there uh, per grade. So, and New York City has, you know, a gazillion students. So, when you're trying to, so if you like math and you, this program, it nurtures and they send you problems and they have other more advanced things that they can do for a smaller number of students. But when it's time to figure out your high school, if you think you, you're interested in math, what if you accidentally went to a high school that didn't have calculus? You're toast. <laughs> All right. Yes, it's sort of just because so already by like eighth grade, you make the wrong choice or, or your school can't help you with that. It just so then it really sets you back. So then when you know when you get into college. So anyway, so that's an example of of trying to nurture people, nurture children if, who are interested in it. Not everyone's interested in it. I mean, I don't like horseback riding. Okay, <laughs> I don't really like economics. I mean, there are plenty of things that I like. You know, tried, studied, whatever. But you know, there are different things that people, as you say, find your daemon. So. You know, there are some sort of, stru sort of structural problems in that some of these kids could end up, without this program, you know, no one would, would look and say, oh, gee, what's the math curriculum at James Madison? I'm using the example James Madison High School, um, where, and I, that's a very large high school, so I'm sure they have it. And um, we also find a program for well, we didn't have calculus where I grew up. In fact, I I often ask Annie, uh, who's who's quite good at mathematics, to even explain to me what is calculus because it was it was something we had pre calc, but I didn't even there was nothing. We didn't have trigonometry. We had we had none of those things. So it's interesting. Um, it turned out fine. Yeah, I did, <laughs> but not as a mathematician. Right. So, exactly. So it just but. You said my uh, my trigger word, my favorite word is uh, patterns, because I think that patterns are uh, the way that we discover new things in the world. And uh, you were talking before about the pandemic. When you look at it from your wide view of, of having grantees and access to science, what are patterns that you have observed about the coronavirus that other people maybe haven't seen so far, or can't see because they don't have the access to the information that you do? All right, so one of the challenges I have is I'm so embedded in it, I often forget what is not common knowledge. All right, so one of the, all right, so we have no medicine, we have no vaccine. The medical community, you know, pharmaceutical community, there's all sorts of partnerships, and I really think it's great the way the government has been funding the manufacturing so that the if these candidates turned out to be good, they're already manufactured, right? So we don't have to then wait another year. So I think there are lots of good things, but it takes time. You just, and I even, I'm even, I even I didn't know that was happening. I didn't, I didn't realize that that was happening. So oh, they are, no. So they one are, of the, one of the important um, things, all right, so vaccines can take a long time to develop. And because you, you have to figure out, okay, what is going to give you the immune response? And remember this coronavirus Nobody knew about it. Okay, it's a t they called it the novel coronavirus, all right? Fortunately, with those techniques I talked about for like reading the DNA sequence, the scientists quickly were able to isolate, um, you know, the genetic, it's an RNA virus, isolate that, you know, determine the sequence and start working on vaccines. And fortunately, there are people who studied coronaviruses just because they thought they were interesting. So, for example, uh, I have a colleague in North Carolina named Ralph Barrick who studied, he's been studying coronavirus. He's studied the SARS, the one that caused the SARS outbreak, the one that um, people in this country aren't that familiar with, the MERS, uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus. Yeah, we've talked about of, it on this podcast. Yeah. All right. No, but I'm just saying, so he's studying coronaviruses, all right? He's studying them. He doesn't. He doesn't know we're going to have a pandemic, he's, but he's studying them. So what's good, though, is when, we, when this is at, he's there as an expert and 
has expert advice because he's already been trying to develop, you know, work in this space of like, how do you think about therapeutics? How do you think about vaccines? So this is my plug for the importance of funding basic scientific research because, you know, we need to, we need to learn about these things. So anyway, and so I know that he's involved with one of the efforts to develop a vaccine. There are many efforts. There's a, a company uh, up in Boston named Moderna, very interesting uh, RNA company. And um, the reason I know about it is uh, it turns out I, at my PhD advisor's 75th birthday scientific conference, I met a very interesting scientist there who, who actually works up there. So I was, I was, I learned a lot about that before, um, before uh, the coronavirus. Oh, and th oh, this is, I forgot to tell you sort of a few things, Vance. One, life is a job interview. <laughs> Two, always be open to new ideas. And three, I can never know too many people. That's how I go through life. All right. It's just sort of people, you're meeting people, all sorts of opportunities have come my way that I didn't even know existed. So that's why I give the life's a job I interview. I'm always interested. So again, when I met this woman who got her PhD in the Walsh lab after I did, but it's like, it was so interesting to me what she was doing in terms of the, this RNA company and how she'd been in academia and so on. And so who knew that a few years later, you know, her company is like at the, is it one of the companies at the forefront of vaccine development? So, um, and, and I personally, all right, so I'm in a risk group for coronavirus. I'm above a certain age. So I saw an advertisement in a, um, in a local newspaper that said wanted volunteers for the coronavirus vaccine trial. So I, I'm in the, I'm in their database. I've filled out the paperwork. Maybe I, so maybe I personal, that's one thing that I can personally do for the pandemic. So that, you went and you went and got a shot and you don't well, know. Not yet. No, there there's, I've like signed all the paperwork because they have to like study your medical records in, in terms of, you know, am I really healthy enough? Do I really, do I have some strange underlying condition that you don't want? All see? of that is living your beliefs. I mean, I got to say very impressive. What can I do in this pandemic? Okay. So the, um, you know, I'm glad our tax dollars are being used to sort of like fund the, manufacturing of the vaccines while they're being developed. So we're going to throw away a lot of stuff, okay, because not all of them will work. But the ones that work, we, we will have a whole manufactured supply. And also you can deal with the supply chain issues. Do we have enough vials? Do we have enough needles? And everybody's taking different approaches. Is it one shot? Is it two? Is it, you know, can you drink it or sneeze it or Smell so it. you may find this interesting. I think one of the most interesting people I've met uh, since coronavirus started around the this concept of coronavirus is a, is a guy named Kevin McKernan. I don't know if you know him. Yeah. He runs a company called Medicinal Genomics. And his concern was because he does not, he doesn't gr grow cannabis. He actually runs the tests to be able to genetically sequence your cannabis to be able, he worked no, on the Human important. Genome Project. No, no, that's important because it, it, I mean, it's well, and so his, legal his research in, uh, all the three states. Well, and his research was we're not so certain that uh, coronavirus can't be spread onto cannabis and that you could be uh, lighting it on fire and having people breathe it in. And so he started sequencing um, the, and, and really researching into this. So you're always saying about you wanted to, to meet, you know, you can never meet enough people. Oh. Kevin McKernan, I think, is of all the people that I've interviewed, the most, uh, the most novel and the most uh, um, interesting. So I write him anytime a new study comes out. I'm always asking right. him. He's a very, very interesting guy. Okay. So Vance, we're going to do a little experiment on your show. I want you to hold your hand up in front of your mouth. And now I want you to say, Peter Piper picked a peck, pick a peck of pickled peppers. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. So what, did you feel anything on your hand? Oh, yeah. I mean, I know all about that, the peas that pop them out. And all right. Send well, so one of the things that we, because we're going to talk about coronavirus and what we can do sort of for healthy congregation, protect our families, yet hopefully, you know, live as normal lives as possible. So people have trouble understanding invisible things, they have trouble like what really is in the air. I mean, my air looks fine. I don't see any cloud, you know, I don't see you smoking a big cigar with a cloud of smoke, but that'll be an important metaphor later. All right. But the, 
by doing that simple experiment, Peter Piper, right, just talking, you could, you could experience the air being expelled from you. All right? And, the, and depending upon, if, you, if you're just breathing, you can feel it. But when you're talking, loud talking is going to be a stronger. Singing is going to be stronger. Really excited. You've had a couple drinks. You saw your old friend. You're yelling. It's, so this is just how people are. We're, this, is, we've, this is normal. All right. So now think about we have this novel coronavirus. And 40% of, pe of the people who are infected either show or, or never have symptoms or wander around for days before they get symptoms, but they're infectious. So how do you protect against that? They're like, okay. So we know that when people talk or breathe or whatever, they're expelling the virus who are infected. Now, some of it sort of falls onto the surface. Remember, you, know, you, don't, you don't want to touch surfaces, keep washing your hands. Okay, so you could have touched the surface that someone just spoke loudly at the bar, and you have an exposure route that way. Some of it also sort of like um, will just naturally decay. I mean, it's, it's a virus. It's not living in something. That, so there's people study the natural decay. But some of it is just going to linger in the air. It's, it's, it can just keep floating around. It just, okay, so think about, like, you're at that bar that for some reason they allow smoking. Most places don't. Okay, so like a big puff of smoke. Okay, where does that go? It's sort of like your breath. It goes all over the place. I mean, if I'm sitting here and someone over there smoking a cigar, I'm going to know. So it's just like thinking of just like what's going on in the room. So how can we, how can we protect ourselves from those things? All right. So this gets back to most times we want the building to help us. So can we bring in more fresh air from outside, either by opening windows or operating the heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems of an enclosed space? Sometimes those are giant central systems. Sometimes they're window units for air conditioning. So, so what can you do to sort of make your air better? Can you Dilute it out. You know, dilution is the solution to pollution, all right? So can you dilute it out? On the other hand, if you have a pile of something that smells really bad there and you don't move, remove that source, then it's still going to be bad, okay? So that goes to, we'll have fewer people in the room, okay? Because if they're the source. But then, all right, so if the air is going to be filtered, all right, so you can dilute the air by either opening a window or having your system take in more outsourced side air, or you can filter the air. So this gets back to the HEPA filtration we were talking about. Okay, you can buy standalone units to filter the air, or you can look at your um, central your HVAC system and say, oh, I can upgrade. I'm currently using one that's graded an 11. If I can take it up to a, a grade of MERV 13, that'll just filter more stuff out again. In some establishments, um, and I've heard this like from homeowners in Florida who are upgrading their indoor, the, you know, Florida, it's kind of hot, so you, you, you're indoors when it's really hot. Um, but also some buildings, can you put UV lights into your HVAC system? All right, so let's go back to Florence Nightingale, sunlight kills germs, fresh air is good. Scientists at the Department of Homeland Security have shown that sunlight kills coronavirus. So when you're outside, it's dying fast. All right. So if you and the re, what kills it is the um, ultraviolet rays. Think of a rainbow, long, red at the top, 
Violet at the bottom is the shorter. Oh, I know. That's one of the reasons we use your violet. It's the most exciting part of the light spectrum. Well, anyway, all right, good. So ultraviolet is even, all right. So, uh, but those are the rays that can uh, inactivate virus, whatever. So you can put them in HVAC systems. So these are things that people have to first know what's available. Then they have to make choices. Like, in their space, in terms, like as I said, remove the source. So if you only have, if you usually have, uh, for example, like the church that I go to on Sundays, I've made some choices. It's important. It's important for me to go to church. I want to go to church every week. All right. So I go to the first, the first session. Why do we do that? Because no one's been in the church all night. <laughs> all right. Our our church requires masks we'll talk about masks in a minute um they require social distancing and they have purell whatever so i feel that when i go there every i can participate in the service this is very important to me i'm not in if i if i'm an asymptomatic carrier i don't think i'm i am infecting anyone because I'm either with my husband or else there are no people close by, it's limited occupancy. And, you know, that's something I can do. So I'm very happy because I, that was like one, when we, when things were really bad in New York city, that was, that was not an option. And I just, you know, the thing for me is my community, not just like watching it on TV and trying to read along. So that's a, that's a choice that I've made. And, but again, doing the assessment in terms of it's a cavernous building. So there's a lot of air in there. That limited source in terms of the people. We're, we're wearing masks and we're not near each other. So, you know, so it starts about masks, air, and distance. So, uh, but last night, New York City opened indoor dining. So I love eating at restaurants, but I'm going to be really, I mean, I sort of use the same analogy they used in terms of going, you know, to my religious services. Like, is, is the place going to be full when I get there, even if it's limited capacity? So that's, there's a bigger chance of, I'm saying the people are the source of the virus. All right. So. You have a source of a bad smell, of a source of a virus. Like, you know, if you eliminate the source, um, you eliminate that the issue. But, you know, can I sit near a window? Um, is it a cavernous space so we have a lot of air? I mean, just so I, I need to think about these things because I haven't been in a restaurant since the end of February. I've been, I've experienced outdoor dining and I have enjoyed that, but I'm very selective because I want to make sure I'm not next to the people because you know what? When I'm eating and drinking, I can't wear a mask. It's definitely going to be uh, an interesting thing to see how culture restarts and, and how the gears get going and then how they slow down again and how they start back up. It'll be interesting to watch. And it's, uh, it's good that we have all of these different places to experiment and try things out. Paula, this has been a wild ride from coronavirus through, you know, uh, the studying of of, uh, of different ideas. This is really a lot of fun. So thank you so I've much. I've had a great show. time, Vance, and I, I am grateful for the invitation to speak. And um, I hope to and see if, you soon in person. And if people wanted to learn more about your work at the Sloan Foundation? Um, you can just go to the uh, sloan.org um, if you want to learn more about the indoor chemistry, you can go to uh, indoorchem.org. Uh, if you want to learn about microbiology, the built environment, microbe.net. You can see we always want to try to like disseminate. Um, and Jim, we never even got to talk about sewage surveillance for the coronavirus as an early warning system. But maybe That's a time. whole other reason to have you come on. <laughs> so thank you so much, Paula. Oh, thank you, Vance. This is great. Ah, ah.